All right, so this is video 20 on nuisance ordinances, and we're going to be covering the narrative part of the chapter um, where nuisances, nuisance ordinances come up, and then we're going to talk about nuisance ordinances in general as they're explained by Desmond, and then we're going to look <clears throat> at nuisance ordinances in Lorain County. So to begin with, we're talking about chapter 15, a nuisance. So just to re remind you where we are in the story, we last saw Arlene in the chapter Disposable Ties. She had been evicted, but the new tenant, Crystal, allowed her to stay on. Um, and she's lo still looking for a new apartment and she wrongly believes that Sharina has officially voided her eviction. So what's going on is that Crystal, the new official tenant, calls the police about domestic violence upstairs. Trisha, the upstairs neighbor who, was, uh, who once covered for Arlene and then bonded with her, um, even making up an elaborate backstory about their relationship, um, is fighting with her boyfriend. And it sounds like Trisha's being beaten up, so Crystal calls the police. The police tell Sharina to evict the tenants. Um, the police declare that because of uh, the disturbances that are coming from the apartment, it is a nuisance property. Um, however, they don't say call the uh, evict the tenants who are the source of the problem. They say evict the tenants uh, who evict the tenant who called the police, specifically Crystal. And then Crystal decide, and then Arlene, Sharina decides that she's not going to evict Crystal either. She's going to evict Arlene, who is the person that she's always had um, a kind of a grudge against, right? So the sequence of events, Crystal calls the police about domestic violence upstairs. The police tell Sharina to evict the upstairs tenants. Uh, well, I'm sorry, the police tell Sharina to evict the tenant who called 911. And instead, um, Sharina decides to evict Arlene, who really just can't catch a break. So what's going on here? What's the context for this? The context for this is nuisance ordinances. And this is the way Desmond explains it. In the last decades of the 20th century, the justice system was adopting a system of abrasive policies that would swell police forces and fuel the prison boom, right? Um, so this is, the, this is the policy of mass incarceration that you've probably heard about. Yet, at the same time, this is, this is weird, and I'm going to go back to quoting Desmond here, it was also leaving more and more policing responsibilities to citizens without a badge or a gun. So, um, even as the prison population boomed, America adopted more and more policies that put police responsibilities on people other than the police. Um, and the laws uh, that allow police to punish landlords for the behavior of their tenants are like that, right? So nuisance ordinances is turn out to be a way that the work of policing gets moved from the police to the landlords, right? So these, there are these laws, and they say um, that if a property is declared a nuisance, the landlord has to do something about it, right? Um, and you can see how these come up because you can imagine your annoying neighbor and or maybe even the neighbor down the street that's a drug house or um, there's just a lot of yelling coming from there. Um, and you think this this place is awful, and I just want to be rid of them. Now, you can especially think that if it's a drug house, 
right? So um, the, the, the ordinance is popular because neighbors sometimes want to get rid of tenants, uh, neighbors who are nuisances. But the way it works out in practice is, uh, well, really unfair. It's just, just unjust. So reasons that properties are declared a nuisance. The most common reason um, I listed uh, is just trouble with subjects, which is this b incredible catch-all that could, cap could mean anything. Noise, domestic violence. The important thing, this is, this list comes from data that was gathered by Matthew Desmond and another one of his collaborators named Valdez um, from the article, Unpolicing the Urban Poor, the consequences for third party policing for inner city women. Um, so what they did is they looked at police records of um, nuisance ordinance, uh, properties that were declared nuisances in Milwaukee between 2008 and 2009. And this was the list of the most common reasons. So one is a ridiculous catch-all, one is noise, and the third most common one is domestic violence. What happens when landlords are told that a property is a nuisance? In the vast majority of cases, landlords who received a nuisance citation for domestic violence responded by either evicting the tenants or threatening to evict them for future police calls. That is, um, the police are getting a lot of calls about a property. The police declare the property a nuisance. Once the police declare the property a nuisance, they turn it over to the landlord. The landlord's response is to evict the tenants or threaten to evict the tenants if they do anything that attracts the attention of the police again. And it's important to recognize that this is uh, an action that the police do in um, coordination with the landlords. So Desmond says on the next page, each of these landlords, um, he's, he's given some examples, received a letter from the Milwaukee Police Department. This notice serves to inform you that the written course of action is accepted. So, you know, um, what happens is if you call the police for domestic violence, you are likely to be evicted. Um, via this nuisance ordinance, ordinance. Desmond comments, after the numbers were released, the Milwaukee's chief of police appeared on local news and puzzled over the fact that many victims uh, of domestic violence were never, uh, never contacted the police for help. And well, it's clear that the nuisance ordinance shows that there's a reason for that. So now I want to call your attention to footnote 11. Um, so you may not be paying attention to the footnotes in this book, but actually all sorts of f fun, well, fun, fascinating, exciting. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the footnotes. So in footnote 11 on this section, Desmond specifically outlines, he's letting himself more into the story here, um, which he doesn't normally do in the bulk of the book. Uh, basically, in 2011, he and Valdez published these results. They shared them with the police department. Um, and so this bit of activism, um, this bit of um, uh, this bit of activism led to a result. Um, the rule was changed so that domestic violence no longer, um, is a reason why a property can be called a, a declared a nuisance. But Desmond thinks that this is inadequate, and he gives two reasons here. And this is a nice part of the book because um, 
it's an argument. And because I was trained as a philosopher, I always love it when there are arguments with premises that I can number. So this is what he says. Domestic violence incidents often hide behind other police designations, antiseptic and context barren, such as property damage or subject with weapon. Point is that um, the domestic violence doesn't always get written down as domestic violence. The second problem is that nuisance laws rely on landlords to reveal whether the problem was domestic violence. So this is in the bottom paragraph on the slide that you can see here. Um, landlords have been threatened with hefty fines and the easiest thing for them to do is just um, try and get things out of their hair as quickly as possible. So you can't count on landlords to reveal the nature of the situation. Bottom line, those two premises lead to a conclusion, and we can write this all up in standard form. Dropping domestic violence from the list of nuisance activities will not protect victims of domestic violence from the effects of the law, that is the law that allows the police to, collect, to declare properties nuisance, um, uh, nuisances. Uh, the last part of footnote 11 is also um, important here because it gets to Desmond's big thesis um, in the unpolicing the poor thing. Um, nuisance, you might ask, well, who's, you know, you, you want to bring a justice perspective and you say, well, um, are the tenants in the property guilty of a crime? But nuisance tenants are not guilty or innocent because the whole goal of the ordinance is to move this bit of um, organizing society away from the purview of the court. Um, and so you may have rights that you can exert in this situation. Um, but as Desmond suggests that a lot of the people in these situations are too poor to even, um, well, I'll just read the passage so that I can get the wording right. The only reason that it is tolerated is because families struggling to make ends meet in low-income housing markets are simply too poor or vulnerable to assert their obvious rights. You have a right, but, Jesus, the situation you're in, you are not going to be, uh, you're not going to have the strength to do it. You're not going to have the strength to assert it. All right. So the last part of this video, I want to talk about what's going on in Ohio with this. So one of the things that Hap, uh, Desmond asserts in his book is that Milwaukee is working as a stand-in for cities all over the, all over the country. And um, a lot of cities work like Milwaukee, a lot of them don't. Um, I have a feeling cities on the West Coast don't work as much like Milwaukee because of the, just, just the craziness of the housing market out there. But in Northern Ohio, we've got a lot of cities on like Milwaukee. They're old industrial cities. They had been destination cities for the Great Migration. Um, so I think Desmond's findings will carry over well to um, Cleveland, Lorraine, Elyria. The ACLU did a report on nuisance ordinances in Ohio. They have a bunch of findings. Um, so they talk about canos, which are just criminal activity nuisance ordinances, the same thing that we're talking about. Um, and they say they mainly impact, so this is a, just a list of their, the ACLU's findings about, about nuisance ordinances. Um, and a couple of them fit the kind of thing that uh, Desmond's talking about. Um, a lot of 
uh, a lot of this is not minor non-criminal behavior, like noise ordinances. Um, in many cities across Ohio, put survivors of domestic violence at heightened risk of eviction by defining domestic violence as a nuisance activity. So Milwaukee did that, Desmond objected, and they took um, that part out of the law. Nevertheless, Desmond thinks that the nuisance ordinances are still a problem for victims of domestic violence. So it's worth taking a look at what's going on in Northeast Ohio, in our region. So this is um, criminal activity nuisance ordinances with domestic violence in Cuyahoga County. Um, so not Lorraine County, but right next door. The dark blue are areas that um, include domestic violence as a reason why something might, a property might be declared a nuisance. The light blue areas are um, ones that don't include it, and uh, the white areas just don't have nuisance ordinances at all. The striped blue areas are areas that removed it. We do have information from this report about Lorraine County, or about, um, about Lorraine County as well. So you can see that the city of Lorraine and Avon Lake both have nuisance ordinances. And uh, Avon Lake includes domestic violence as a reason why a property might be declared a nuisance. So once a property is declared a nuisance in Avon Lake, um, perhaps because there's domestic violence going on there, people living in that property might now be evicted because the landlord is responsible for essentially the policing, right? And uh, this is something that winds up putting victims of domestic violence at risk. So this is the sort of thing that uh, you might want to do in your paper. Um, just take a look at what's some of the things that Desmond talks about in Milwaukee and do some web research and see if it applies to Lorraine and Cuyahoga County. Um, and my general feeling is that most of the time it does.